your Bible, please, to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Let us pray. Loving Father, it is with a fresh sense of gratitude that we enter into thy holy presence through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the rending of the veil from top to bottom. There was a day when we poor sinners were excluded from the Holy of Holies, but now we have access and we can come boldly. We thank Thee for this wonderful access that we have. Thank You, Father, for sending some out this morning for the ministry of the Word. We pray that the truth will come to us in the Spirit's power, and that it will do something for us and add to our spiritual growth. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There are two imminent events for which every one of us can be looking day by day. <clears throat> now, an imminent event is an event that can occur at any moment. It might not, but it can occur at any moment. One of those imminent events is death. You have no lease on life, nor do I. It is not impossible that someone could be carried dead from this tabernacle this morning. I don't know if anybody ever died in this tabernacle during the many years of its ministry, but I say it is not impossible. Many people have died in a church pew. More than one preacher has dropped dead on the platform in the process of either preaching or performing one of his duties before his congregation. My friend of many, many years, Dr. Lewis Paul Lehman, died suddenly at Calvary Church in Grand Rapids. We have no lease on life. Death is imminent. I'm sure we all have heard it said we're here today and gone tomorrow. But I wouldn't count on that, dear friends, because any one of us is here today and could be gone today. There might not be a tomorrow for some of us. Death is imminent. It can occur at any moment. Are you ready? Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I am now ready. He was not in the process of getting ready. He said, I am now ready, 2 Timothy 4. The time of my departure is at hand. The time of my going away, it has come. I am now ready. My, it must be wonderful just to be ready when the time comes. I hope you're ready, dear friend. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Death is imminent. The other imminent event, now remember, an imminent event is not an immediate event. Do not confuse the terms imminency and immediacy. An imminent event is not an immediate event. It's an event that can occur at any moment. And the other imminent event for which the believer looks is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to translate, to rapture, to remove his church from earth to heaven. There is no prophecy that must be fulfilled before the Lord Jesus Christ appears to remove his church from earth to heaven. That is an imminent event. It can occur before this meeting is over this morning. You can't find one prophecy in the Bible that must be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. It is an imminent event. And this morning I want to direct your attention to some familiar portions of Scripture that deal with the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. What I would like you to see is that Bible prophecy has a unique way of meeting the spiritual needs of God's people. Uh, many people go to a prophecy conference out of curiosity. Uh, they want to know what uh, does Dr. So-and-so believe about when will Russia invade Israel or uh, who is the Antichrist or who are the kings of the East, when will they appear or what is the prophetic significance of the knot holes in Noah's Ark? People have some strange questions 
curious at a prophecy conference. Now the big event in Bible prophecy, as far as we are concerned, is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is an imminent event. Now there are some seven or eight key passages that I've looked at in the New Testament concerning the imminent return of Christ. And I would like to direct your attention to a few of them as far as time will allow. I am not kidding you. I am not fooling around when I tell you that in spite of that implant in my eye, I cannot see the time on that clock from here. But I can see my watch, so feel relieved. It's quarter, 14 minutes past nine, and I promise you this morning that I will quit just as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> now your Bible's open to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Now this is a portion of Scripture that many old-timers have memorized. We don't have much Scripture memorization today. There are so many versions of the Bible and translations of the Bible and perversions of the Bible that people hop from one to the other and they don't stay with one long enough to memorize Scripture. But there was a time when scripture memorization was a part of our daily Christian experience. John 14 is one of those portions. Will you please look at it in your Bible? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I believe that our Lord was speaking directly to Peter. The chapter division here is not one of the better chapter divisions. I'm sure you are all acquainted with the fact that chapter and verse divisions were not a part of the inspired text. They were added centuries later after the scriptures were given. But if you back up to the preceding verses, there's a conversation between the Lord and Peter. Uh, the Lord told the disciples that he was going away. And uh, Peter said unto him in verse 37, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, he's talking to Peter. Wilt thou <clears throat> lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now he continues right on. He's talking to Peter. Peter, let not your heart be troubled. Now what did the Lord Jesus mean when he said to Peter, let not your heart be troubled? The Greek word for heart is cardia, from which we get our word cardiology. Now that word is used literally of the physical organ in the body that pumps the blood through the system. That is not what our Lord meant when he said, let not your heart be troubled. He wasn't saying, now, Peter, be very careful with your diet. You might collect too much cholesterol and have to have some kind of a surgery, a bypass. He's now isn't thinking of the physical. By the way, have you folks uh, been in touch with these commercials on uh, cholesterol-free shampoo. Uh, it's for fat heads. <laughs> he was not saying to Peter, now, Peter, be careful. You may have to have a bypass. No, when he said, let not your heart be troubled, he was using the word heart figuratively. He was referring to the hidden springs of moral and spiritual life. I think Peter caught the meaning of that word when he wrote his first epistle in chapter 3, verse 4, when he spoke of the hidden man of the heart. What is the hidden man of the heart? That's the real you. That's the real me. It's not that organ that pumps the blood through the body. And oh, that is a vital organ. Without its proper function, we are finished. But that's not what he was talking about. He's using the term figuratively, and Peter writes about the hidden man of the heart, the real you and the real me. 
You see, you don't know the real me. All you know about the real me is what you see and what you hear. You really don't know the real me. God knows the real me, and I'm learning to find out the real me. But you don't know the real me. I don't know the real you. Now, if I knew the real you, I could go up and down these aisles and pick out the people who are having heart trouble. Not the org organ in there that keeps you going. No, no. But in the hidden springs of your innermost being, the real you is troubled about something. Let not your heart be troubled. The real you is troubled this morning. Now, there are many troubled people in this audience. Don't tell me there aren't. Every pastor knows that. Every time we get up to preach, whether it's in a church as a pastor, in a conference like this, we are ministering to people whose real you has some trouble. Somebody came up to me and said, my son's name is, will you please put him on your prayer list? I said, you give him the name. Give, give, him, give me the name and I'll pray for him. I'll have to write it down because I'm, I'll forget. But I'll remember to pray for him if I write it down. Troubled heart. The real you has some trouble this morning. Now, <clears throat> what is one of the solutions to the troubled heart? And you may carry that trouble for the rest of your natural life. God may not take it from you. He may allow you to bear it until he calls you home. But he has given to you something for that troubled heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Now he says, Peter, take courage. Take courage. I am coming back. Did you know that this is the first overt prophecy that our Lord uttered concerning his imminent return to remove his church from earth to heaven? I know the rapture's in here. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the first overt prophecy that our Lord uttered regarding his imminent return to remove the church from earth to heaven. So what do we have here? Well, we have courage for sad hearts. Peter was sad. The Lord was going, Peter said, can I go with you, Lord? The Lord said, no, you're not ready for it now. And you just carry on. You'll have lots of trouble and lots of sadness. But one day I'm coming back and I'll deliver you from it all. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a position where you wanted to die. I reached that stage for the first time in my life almost three years ago. At one low point, I was so low, so miserably weak, the, the best way out would have been to die. Now, there are Christians who are like that. Don't, don't, don't feel badly if you get that low. I talked at a Bible conference about this at dinner table one day, and my guest said, we were at another conference, he said, that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. I said, I'll take it. The Lord promised it. I'll take it. Call it a cop-out, if you will. The Lord said, your heart's sad, but he said, carry on. I'm coming back. I'll relieve you, deliver you from it all, and you'll be with me forevermore. Where I am, there ye may be also. So the coming of the Lord provides courage for sad hearts. Now let's look at another key passage dealing with the imminent return of Christ. Turn with me, please, to Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. His first epistle to the Thessalonians. <clears throat> Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonians, and they are his prophetic epistles. Now, there's a lot of prophecy in the other epistles of Paul. There's a book that's been out of print for a long time. It was written, and it hasn't been reprinted. I'd like to see some publisher pick it up. It uh, was written by the late Dr. A.C. Gabeline, 
And the title of the book is The Prophet, St. Paul. Everybody refers to him as the Apostle Paul, and he was an apostle. But throughout his writings, there is much prophetic truth. Dr. Gabelan wrote an excellent book on the prophet, St. Paul. He gleaned the prophetic statements of Paul and expounded on them and put them in a book. First and Second Thessalonians are two of the prophetic epistles of Paul. These epistles major on the return of Christ. Now, if you read through the five chapters of First Thessalonians, you will notice that each chapter concludes with an emphasis on the return of Christ. It's at the end of the chapter. You won't find it in the beginning of the chapter. You won't find it in the middle of the chapter. You find it at the end of the chapter. All five chapters can conclude with an emphasis on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is dealing with one phase of the Christian's life that brought sadness to the Christian. Before this epistle was written, the early believers knew nothing about the future of dead loved ones who died in the Lord. Nothing was written on that. The Lord said, I'm coming back in John 14, but he didn't say anything about the, the Christians who would die before he got here. And in Thessalonica, believers had died and their hearts were heavy because those loved ones were taken from them. And the Holy Spirit, knowing something of the concern and the consternation in their hearts, he directed Paul to say a word to those believers concerning the loved ones who had gone on before. And so he begins this classic passage with verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now the word sleep throughout this passage is a synonym for the death of the body. The Bible does not teach soul sleep. We are created by God to eternal conscious existence, conscious existence. You will be conscious throughout eternity in heaven or in hell. Now you'll follow through the context and you'll find it's a synonym for the word death, the death of the body. Not always. Usually sleep refers to what we hope to get when we uh, go to our beds at night or what we sneak in in a church service occasionally. Uh, that's literal sleep. Uh, that little poem last night, if you weren't here last night for the service, someone said, I never see the preacher's eyes, no matter how bright they shine. When he prays, he closes his, and when he preaches, I close mine. Now, that is sleep, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the death of the body. And believers in Thessalonica had loved ones who died, and nothing was written yet to tell them their future. The Lord said to the disciples, I'm coming back. But he said nothing about the dead believers. And so Paul was writing now to bring comfort to those dead, to those living saints who had believers who died. I like the way Vance Habner uh, used to put it. When his wife died, he preached the following Sunday. The doctor said, you just get out and preach. Don't you sit home and sit around. You go on preaching. And the, the following Sunday, he was preaching. And the lady came up and wiping a tear from her eye, she said, Dr. Hamner, I'm so sorry that you lost your wife. And Dr. Hamner said, I didn't lose her. I know where she is. When you know where something is, it ain't lost. We don't lose loved ones when they die in the Lord. I know how you feel. I lost my husband. No, you didn't. If your husband was a believer, you didn't lose him. You miss him. Now, these believers were concerned about their loved one. And they hadn't been taught anything. Now, Paul was going to solve that problem. Now, he said, don't be ignorant concerning your loved ones who have died. Beginning with verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, scare one another with these words. It would be a frightening thing, wouldn't it, if you weren't saved? Be enough to scare any unbeliever listening to my voice right now who isn't saved. To think that Jesus Christ could come at any moment and you are not prepared for eternity, do you know that you will have sealed your doom for all eternity? If he were to come now and you are not saved, that'd be scary. That'd be enough to frighten anyone. You say, Boy, do I have to get scared into the kingdom? Well, I don't care how you get in. You can get in scared if you want. Just get in. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Now here is a clear picture of what's going to happen. First, I want you to note, look at verse 16, the return. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He's going to return. I will come again. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Now watch closely. Now he's answering their problem. The question to their problem is, what about my loved ones who have died? They were saved. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now you have the return, and then you have the resurrection. That takes place first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Why do they rise first? Well, I don't know theologically. The late Dr. James McGinley used to say they rise first because they have six feet further to travel. When the Lord, I don't know. But they will rise. You have a resurrection. Now that takes care of the loved ones who have died. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now watch it. It's all in your Bible. Then we which are alive and remain shall be, what class? Caught up. That's the rapture. Now you have the return, you have the resurrection, and you have the rapture. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up. What are the next two words after up? With them, together with them. Together with whom? together with those loved ones who have died in the Lord. That's the reunion. It's going to be a reunion. I like that old Negro spiritual, there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. On the way up, there's going to be a reunion. Someone says, you think I will know my husband on the way up? You think I will know my wife or my mother or my daddy? Do you think you're going to have less sense in heaven than you had here on earth? You knew them down here. You'll know them. Yes, I think there will be heavenly recognition. But really, dear friends, that's not the major thing we ought to be contemplating. Will I know my loved ones in heaven? Yes, I don't think we'll be so much concerned about that. A dear lady said to me at a conference, she said, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do is going to look up all my Baptist friends. Well, I said, I hope they're all there. <laughs> I said, I'm, I don't think you'll be doing that. I think we'll be so occupied with the Lord Jesus. I think that will be the thing to thrill our hearts, to see him. For we shall be like him. I don't think I'll be running around heaven looking for anyone. My mind cannot conceive of any foolish time wasted like that in heaven. We'll, we'll know our loved ones, but I think we'll be attracted to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, you have a return, you have a resurrection, you have a rapture, and you have a reunion. Now, what is the result? So shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, the first passage, we have courage for sad hearts and comfort for sorrowing hearts. Go back to verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not 
as others who have no hope. Now, he doesn't tell you not to sorrow. He said, I would not have you to sorrow, period. I would not have you to sorrow as others who have no hope. The Lord Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was sorrowful. Not wrong to be sorrowful. He was sorry. Sorrowed more than once. Don't sorrow as others who have no hope. The best is yet to be. So you have courage for sad hearts in John 14 and comfort for sorrowing hearts in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now let's look at a couple of other passages that deal with the imminent return of Christ. Just about 26 minutes before 10. <clears throat> Turn to the first epistle of John, please. The first epistle of John. And find chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children. Now, he's not referring to little boys and little girls. The term little children is used frequently in the first epistle of John, and it's a translation of a Greek term which really means born ones, born again ones. 1 John is a family letter. It's written to the born again ones, and John uses this endearing term, my born ones, my born again ones. And now little children abide in him. That word abide can be translated remain, continue. Don't break fellowship with the Lord. Keep in fellowship with him day after day, hour after hour. Don't let anything break fellowship with you and your Lord. Nothing between my Savior and me. That should be my goal throughout this day. And now, little children, abide in Him. Remain in fellowship. Continue in fellowship. And now, little children, abide in Him that when, now watch this, He shall appear. Mark that in your Bible. He shall appear. We shall be like Him. No. That we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He's challenging us here to a life of unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Abide in him, remain in fellowship with him. He's coming again, he shall appear. You don't want to be put to shame at his coming. What would you like to be doing when Jesus comes? Hmm? Say, I'd like to be playing golf. That's all right. Nothing wrong with golf. I have a problem. But I don't play it anymore since my illness. I had a problem with golf. My problem was the ball went where I hit it. That was my problem. Nothing wrong with golf. You can honor the Lord by going out for some good, healthy exercise and fresh air. But you don't want to be doing anything would dishonor him, do you? We want to be caught in a fit of anger. Wouldn't want to have him come when you're not on speaking terms with your spouse. I was preaching in Huntington, West Virginia on a Mother's Day. And at the close of the service, Sunday night, a lady came forward weeping. She said, please pray for me. I've got to get home and call my mother. She said, my mother and I have not spoken a word to each other in 18 years. And she said the <clears throat> incident that brought this separation was a trivial thing. It has just grown and grown and grown and we've both been stubborn and neither one would make the break. And she said, if God will spare me to get back to my house, I want to make a long distance telephone call and say, Mother, I'm sorry for my behavior. Please forgive me. She said, I would feel terrible if the Lord came tonight before I got that straightened out. That's what John's talking about here. And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed, not be put to shame at his coming. Are you ready now? Or is there an unconfessed sin 
something in your life that would really put you to shame if the Lord were to appear at this moment. Now look at chapter 3 of the same epistle just across the page. Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, I hear your three words again, he shall appear. Mark that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man, that means every person, that's a generic term for both sexes, and every person who has this hope in him, not in himself, but in the coming one, the one who's going to appear, our hope is in him. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. The hope is not in ourselves, it's in him. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, Christian, even as he, Jesus, is pure. What is John talking about in these passages? He's talking about the appearing of the Lord, and he's dealing with the sin question. The coming of the Lord provides courage for sad hearts, comfort for sorrowing hearts, and cleansing for sinful hearts. Do you see the effect of Bible prophecy on the life of the believer? Knowing that Christ could appear at any moment, what a challenge to be ready! You say, well, suppose I'm not ready. Well, it's possible that you're here and you're not ready. It is not impossible that somebody brought an unconfessed sin into this meeting. You're not right with God. You know it. And God knows it. And maybe someone else knows it. Is that the way you want to go? My wife and I had one trip to Israel back years ago, when the late Dr. William Culbertson, late president at Moody Bible Institute, and I were speakers on a tour. And uh, <clears throat> we were on, Elsie and I were standing on Mount Nebo, looking out over the plains of Moab, where Moses uttered his orations. And <clears throat> the thought came to me, we are standing on the spot of a dramatic event. And I said to Elsie, do you know what happened here where we're standing? She said, yes. This is where God put Moses to death prematurely. This is where God killed Moses, Mount Moab. And God told him why he did this. Moses wanted to go into the promised land. The Lord said, you can look at it. And Moses stood there on Mount, well, Mount Nebo and he looked out over the plains of Moab, and the Lord said, have a good look, but you're not going. And Moses said, I'm not ready to die. And the Lord said, I know you think you're not, but you're going to die. And God put him to death right there. And when Elsie reminded me of what happened on that mountain, I said, honey, that's not the way I want to go. That's not the way I want to go. I don't want God to have to step in and say, I'm sorry. But you haven't dealt with some sins. You've carried on with them and continued with them. You're no good to me here. You're not glorifying me. I might just as well take you home to heaven. The coming of the Lord should challenge us to cleansing our sins. How do we get cleansed? Well, the first thing we do is we have to confess the sin. 1 John 1, 9. The word confess means to say the same thing say the same thing. That's the meaning of the Greek term. So if I'm confessing a sin, now listen carefully, I don't come to God and say, Lord, please forgive me. You can say, forgive me a thousand times and never confess anything. Asking for forgiveness is not confessing sin. Confessing sin is saying, Lord, I lied to so-and-so. Lord, I was dishonest. I misappropriated that money. Lord, I falsified the record. That's confession. May I repeat, asking for forgiveness is not confession. 
And you can ask for forgiveness a million times and never confess a sin. The scripture says if we confess our sins, you name it, then God in faithfulness to his son, who died for the sin you and I are confessing, God will forgive and God will cleanse. Now knowing that the return of the Lord is imminent, that it could occur at any moment, should challenge every one of us in this audience to be ready. And if you have sin, a sin that has not been dealt with, then my friend, the time to deal with it is N-O-W now. Now I'm not going on with the other passage or passages. There's one in 1 Corinthians, one in Philippians 3, one in Colossians 3. I'll just pass them up. Time will not allow. But I think this would be a fitting time to close our this part of the meeting with prayer. Now let us bow in prayer. Now while our heads are bowed and you're contemplating the theme of the morning, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus, let me ask you a personal question. Did you bring into this meeting an unconfessed sin? Is there something not only between your soul and your Savior, but between you and maybe a spouse, maybe a son, a daughter, maybe between you and your parents, or you and your neighbor, or you and someone in your local assembly? I would suggest to you, dear one, the thing to do is to confess that now. Now why don't you take just a moment now, call upon God, and take that skeleton out of the closet of your heart and say, Lord, this is my sin I have, and name it right now. Just tell it to the Lord. Now, when we do that, God in faithfulness to his dear son, who died for the sin that we have confessed this morning, will do two things. He will forgive us, and he will cleanse us. Now you say, what do I do? Well, now you forsake it. Don't go back and repeat it. Oh, you could, and you might, but the challenge is to forsake it. Pays to be ready, doesn't it? Loving Father, we thank Thee for the blessings of these few moments together this morning. Take this very precious but perilous truth and bring it home to our hearts with new freshness. We shall give Thee the praise, for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.